gave at the National Press Club in December 1986. His remarks were delivered just 11 months before his death from cancer. And correspondent for the Lowell, Massachusetts Sun. I'd like to welcome our members to this luncheon today as well as their guests and to those individuals listening to this broadcast live over the national public radio stations, 303 of them, or those who will be watching it later on one of the 2300 cable systems affiliated with C-SPAN, Cable Satellite Public Affairs Network. Before going any further with today's luncheon, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming events here. Next Tuesday, December 16th, our luncheon guest will be Senator William J. Fulbright. That will be the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the Fulbright Scholarship Program. <clears throat> Future speakers also include Nobel Prize winning economist James Buchanan on January 23rd and Energy Secretary John Harrington on February 19th. I would like to remind those of you in the audience that if you have any questions for our speaker today, and I trust that you will, please write them down on the cards on your table and send them to the front. I will ask as many questions as time permits. I would now like to introduce our guests at the head table. I ask them to please stand when I call out their names briefly. <laughs> and the ads, the ads to withhold their applause until I'm completed. From left is uh, Bernard Shaw of Cable News Network. I don't get any respect. <laughs> Lena Williams of the New York Times. Adrian Farrell, a writer on foreign affairs and a member of our club speakers committee who organized today's luncheon. Jean-Maurice Ripère of the French Embassy. Randy Allen, vice president of Pyramid Video and chairman of the club speakers committee. Dorothy Gilliam of the Washington Post. H. Finley Lewis, the Washington bureau chief of the Minneapolis Tribune and Ernest White of WDCU-FM and Washington Living Magazine. <clears throat> Our guest today, author James Baldwin, offers a fine lesson for those of us who are writers and those of us who are readers that we both shall well heed. It's a message of clarity, wisdom, insight, and determination. It was a message that was and remains one that needs to be heard. 23 years ago, I'm sorry, 33 years ago, Mr. Baldwin's first book, Go Tell on the Mountain, was published. But it was 23 years ago that his essay, The Fire Next Time, was what first brought him international acclaim, that essay is dissecting the U.S. racial problems. The road from there has been one of a continual climb into deeper respect from his peers and a reaffirmation of that message in essays, plays, and more than a dozen books. There have been times, however, when Mr. Baldwin's message while on target has been somewhat controversial. He criticized the American establishment for failing to meet with revolutionary leaders such as Ho Chi Minh, Mao Zedong, and Fidel Castro. He has argued that the myth of white supremacy is crumbling, superiority is crumbling, that warning the television has obliterated recent history and left teenagers with an absence of a feeling of community. He has noted that while the United States was willing to liberate Grenada, he has made no effort to do the same for cities like Detroit or New York. And he has said that the problems of the inner cities, such as drug and alcohol abuse, went unattended until they reached into the white areas of the city. Those are strong words from a man who once said he was too shy to approach Langston Hughes when they both lived in Harlem. Mr. Baldwin said at that time there were two Harlems, a division between the black people who lived on the hill and himself, who he called a raggy, funky, black shoeshine boy. Mr. Baldwin was born in New York City, August 2nd, 1924, the first of nine children. He's a grandson of a slave and a son of a preacher, and he grew up in Harlem, began speaking the gospel at age 14. After graduation, he held a variety of jobs to support himself and his writing. The writing first started appearing after World War II, publication first in the nation and in such magazines as Harper's, American Mercury, The New Leader, Partisan Review, and Commentary. Those works drew Mr. Baldwin into the New York intelligentsia, but in 1948, feeling frustrated with both the church and America's oppression of blacks, he moved to Paris for nine years. As was the case for many artists, Paris was an important breath of fresh air to Mr. Baldwin. He wrote that he felt as though he suddenly came out of a dark tunnel and found himself beneath the open sky. Mr. Baldwin now divides his time between homes in New York City and southern France. Please join me in welcoming Mr. James Baldwin to the National Press Club.
Thank you all very much. Good afternoon. I am very pleased to be here. I am a little surprised when I agreed to do, when I knew I was going to come here. Given my luck, of course, um, the White House was um, not in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> And now, um, I'm terribly aware of that house on the hill, which is in trouble, which means that we are. And I'm curious, I'm just going to improvise around what's on my mind for a few minutes, and then you will ask me questions, and maybe we can have a kind of rap session. If the White House is in trouble, we are. Now, the question is how we got there. And I've some suggestions, uh, purely subjective subject suggestions coming out of my life. But it seems to me that part of what, uh, part of what obsesses me, certainly, is uh, what I call sometimes to myself the view from here. Now, that implies a great many things. First of all, I'm speaking as an American citizen. I'm speaking as also as the grandson of a slave. I'm speaking as a product and a member of um, a certain democracy, and as a product and um, issue of a certain very complex history. Someone who represents a very complex country, which insists on being simple-minded. Simplicity, it occurs to me, has occurred to me more than once in my somewhat stormy life. Simplicity is um, taken to be a great American virtue, along with sincerity. And the result of this is, if you are simple-minded enough, you can become, I didn't want to go that far, <laughs> and if, as long as you're sincere in what you say, you haven't got to know what you're talking about. <laughs> These are the American virtues, two of them anyway. One of the results of this is that immaturity is taken to be a virtue too. So that someone like, let us say, John Wayne, the late John Wayne, who spent most of his time on screen admonishing Indians, um, was under no necessity to grow up. In an, a movie made during the witch hunt era of American life, when Joe McCarthy, kind of a literate sen senator, but very sincere man, was finding communists everywhere. Somebody made a movie called My Son John, which starred, well, I won't bother to talk about the cast, story of a woman whose son is, turns out to be a communist defector, and she has to somehow reconcile herself to this and cooperate with the FBI to save her son's soul. Perfectly okay, all right. But she says at one point to her husband, who's an American Legion, American Legion hero, a model of simplicity, and he understands before anybody else does that his son is really a communist. How does he understand this? Because he is such a virtuous American. And is perfectly willing to put his son to death because his son is a communist. All right, I didn't make that movie. You know, it um, may, or may, may, may or may not have made a lot of money, but it represented something in the climate of the times and something very, very profound in the American experience or the American refusal to endure or accept experience. 
One of the things it seems to me that has always contributed to this adoration of innocence, this adoration of immaturity, so that we really do get representing us a post-adolescent who was almost 80 years old. And, then, and we think of this as, um, as a virtue. One of the things though, that has always afflicted the American reality and the American vision is this aversion to history. History is not something you read about in a book. History is not even the past. It's the present. Because everybody operates, whether or not we know it, out of, star, out of assumptions which are produced and, and produced only by our history. Now, the history of this country is not bloodier than that of other countries, but it's bloody. It is not more criminal than that of other countries, but it's criminal. Or in short, it is not worse than the history of France or England or any country we can name, but it's different. It's different for several reasons. A few weeks ago, I was, having to have the TV set on, and I was, I was flicking it aimlessly for a while, and then I started, and then I started doing it deliberately. And I, what was I watching? I was watching a series of images, all of them bloody, guns, all kinds of weapons, corpses, cowboys and Indians, good guys and bad guys. And for a moment it seemed to me that this, this, this compulsive set of images, I pretended to myself, I was watching a person, a human being, who was very, 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 very ill and was trapped in these images, could not be released from them. Because all of these images come out of the history which we always deny. It is important to recognize that we did steal the land from the people who were here before us. We stole it. And we never honored a single treaty made with a person, that person known as the American Indian. And I repeat, we're not talking about the past, we're talking about the present. We did enslave millions of people because, for no other reason than because they were black, and we did make a lot of money out of slave labor. Neither is this uncommon. It is a part of human history. But it is one thing to do something and another to deny it. The doctrine of manifest destiny reassured all white Americans that as white people, as the guardians of civilization, they had the right and therefore the duty to exterminate whatever stood in the way of the superior civilization. And as for Sambo, though it maybe it can be argued, that is, a, slavery is a strange road to take in order to civilize someone. That was the argument, so that we can see, if we examine our legends, that very shortly after I was discovered in Africa, where I was the sometimes noble savage, I was in the twinkling of an eye after the Middle Passage, I am found on the Metro Goldman Mayor back lot, singing and dancing. The noble savage is now transformed into the happy darkie. No one quite knows how this happened. <laughs> we are living with these myths until today. And it corrupts the view from here. Because part of what has happened is in the, in the effort to 
deny whence we came, we've had to make up a series of myths about it. And myths cannot replace reality. The reason that the Native American is called Indian, for example, is due to a monumental error on the part of um, adventurer sent out by Queen Isabella of Spain to find a passage to India. Chris got lost. <laughs> and when he woke up and saw these people surrounding him, since he had to tell Queen Isabella something, he said, these are Indians. <laughs> and took one back to Spain. We call this era has persisted in the language until this hour. In a similar way, once I became the happy darky, because if I wasn't the happy darky, then something, then I was a slave. Then, and if I wasn't happy, then something was wrong with slavery. So I had to be happy to keep the master happy. To say nothing, of course, to the mistress. Out of this profound misapprehension has come a system of reality, a system of ideas even, a system of thought, which makes reality very hard to reach. When the slave was discovered and put in chains, obviously he was debased, along with his women and his children. But he was not the only creature who was debased at that moment. The man, the people who put him in chains had also become less than human and debased themselves with a further disadvantage. Whereas the slave must know the master because the master's, his, the slave's life is in the master's hands. And the master cannot fool a slave, but the slave can fool the master because the master wants to be fooled. My father, all the years that I lived with him, never dreamed of telling a white person the truth about anything. It simply never entered his mind to do so. He didn't care what they thought, he didn't care if they lived or died, he loathed them. That was very frightening for me to watch. My turn came too. <clears throat> but I could see what had happened. And really it's important now is that out of this endeavor, what we call the white American has created only the nigger he wants to see. The reason that's important and terrifying and corrupts the youth from here is because when this same white man looks around the world, he sees only the nigger he wants to see. And that is morally dangerous for the future of this country for our present fortunes. The world is full of all kinds of people who live quite beyond the confines of the American imagination and who have nothing whatever to do with the guilt-ridden vision of the world which controls so much of our life and our thinking and which paralyzes, paralyzes very nearly our moral sense. We are living in a world in which everybody and everything is interdependent. It is not white, this world. It is not black either. The future of this world depends on everyone in this room. And that future depends on to what extent and by what means we liberate ourselves of a, from a vocabulary which now cannot bear the weight of reality. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Baldwin, uh, these questions come from the audience, and I'll ask as many as I can, as I say. And we have a nice wide variety. There is a movement of brilliant young women writers, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, others. Could you please comment <clears throat> on the, air, the influences, including yourself, that have produced this movement? That's, not, that's, that's by no means an easy question, is it? Partly because I know all those ladies and they're, friend, they're friends of mine. And I'm always a little frightened because I'm afraid to leave somebody out. But anyway, I know them all. I'm not sure I can answer your question. I think, I think, I think first of all, that um, the arrival of Tony and Maya and Paul Marshall and Alice Walker, for example, and Louise Merriweather, was um, in a way in inevitable. It had to come about because uh, of the role that black women have played in this country, and more specifically, the role that black women have played in the lives of all black men. And that has always been a very troubled and even dangerous role because of the position of the black man in this republic, which makes the situation of black women who have got to, who have got to respect their fathers and find a way to protect and protect their sons and their lovers without emasculating them. It was time, it is time that she began to tell something of that story. It is in some senses been condemned. But I think, I welcome it as the, as the ventilation, so to speak, of a family quarrel. It, um, what they have to say is somewhat terrifying, but true. And as for the influences, I've hardly have where to begin. I would have to go back at least as far as W.B. Du Bois. The influences being, in short, that work done by black people, especially black people, to clarify the role of black people here, because most white historians, and most, like most white commentators, until today, are so busy justifying it that they can only lie about it. So that Tony and Maya are excavating us all, helping to excavate all of us from a very dangerous myth. Do you feel the problems of Southern Africa are properly framed by our media in the context of the American experience? Or should these African issues be examined more closely in their own African context? Well, I think that, I think that the, American, the American vision of, um, of Africa has got to be um, compulsively um, defensive. We all, South Africa implicates everyone in this room. It brings into question or it reveals the real meaning of the civilizing mission. Because that's what, that's how Africa was civilized. But we're watching in, the, in Soweto and Johannesburg is the process. No matter how one might want to pretty, pretty it up, no matter what Hollywood, Hollywood has told us. The African context in which it should be examined, of course, scarcely exists in the American imagination. And one of the reasons for that is that it brings into focus in the uneasy American imagination the real role of black people in this country in the uneasy American imagination. The truth being, as concerns the presence of black people here, that in the generality, white people have never, never, never accepted the real meaning of it and are unable to imagine even though it is absolutely true, that this is not and never has been and never can be a white country. We have been here together too long. And the vocabulary which we are avoiding has got to deal with that before it can deal with anything as vivid, as, as dangerous, and as overwhelming as the South African situation. Here's a related question, sir, that perhaps you can answer. <clears throat> Do you think that this administration, and I assume the questioner means the Reagan administration, has a different attitude toward the po black population in South Africa and its concern about the nationalists in Nicaragua 
If so, is this racial? <laughs> you knew they weren't going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, they have no concern. Let's, let's be very blunt about it. I don't think this administration has any concern with Nicaragua either. It, it has a um, concern for what it takes to be its interest. What strikes me is that both Nicaragua and South Africa are expected to remain the pawns of the so-called free world forever. Of course, we are against the freedom, South African black freedom, because it means communism, or well, that's what people say. But we are against freedom in Nicaragua for the same reason. And we have not the remotest notion of what we're talking about in either case. Period. And it is racial. <laughs> Mr. Baldwin, the questioner wants to know if you've seen the movie, She's Gotta Have It. If not, I'll tell you about it after the luncheon. <laughs> but however, they're not interested in my opinion. They want to know what you think about the movie. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it. Okay. Yet. Well, sorry. Okay. Well, we'll go to another question then. A number of black male writers who have criticized the portrayal of black men as abusers, rapists, addicts. Portrait often drawn by black women and one which black men feel perpetuates a negative stereotype. Do you feel that the image of black men is being falsely portrayed? I think the image of black men in this country has always been false. You know, it's late in the day to blame it on black women. Um, the color purple is, of course, the most controversial of these books or movies. And the only way I can answer that question is to say that, um, well, the movie I thought was, I thought the movie was awful, really. And in the movie I felt that if you're going to give me that, that particular man, that black man, then you've got to tell me more about him. You know, I quite, you know, I can quite see, you know, that black men can do all those things, but then there's got to be something wrong with them. You know, and you'd have to, you'd have to let me know something more than the catalog of, these, of this man's brutality. If he, were, if he were white, then he would be, you know, uh, Paul Newman were playing that cat. You realize he was very, very sick, and he'd have all your sympathy, you'd hope he'd get well. But the black image is very, very different. All you've got to do in order, in order to do that is be black. Well, it's, um, it's an image of black people which is not entirely to be, entirely Alice Walker's fault. You know, that is the way the Republic has seen black people, black men, since they heard of black men. And <clears throat> that has had a terrible effect on black women. And on, in that context, if the, if, 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 the, if, the, if the motive is to be liberated from these images by, by exercising them, really, then I, you know, um, amen. Freedom, freedom, it's very difficult to achieve, and, it's very, and the process is very, very awkward. But in order to, to demolish an image, sometimes you have to hold it up to the light and see what weight it will bear, see where it comes from, see, what you, see if you can live with it. And if you can't live with it, get rid of it. That answers your question. This one was written, apparently, as you're uh, answering the last one as a follow-up. Could you please go into detail about the role or the comportment of today's American black male. The, the, what? the, more, the, the role. Of the role. Mm -hmm. what, what should be the role? Well, I have, to, I have to say something a little difficult going back into my own history and black history. What should be the role of the comportment of today's American one of the difficulties about being a black man in this country has always been the difficulty of being a white man. Because it is assumed, it is assumed so profoundly that no one has ever questioned it, I think. That the black man wants to be a white man. White men, as I've observed, are not sure they want to be white. It's got to be exhausting 
<laughs> You'd be endlessly, endlessly flexing your muscles and, you know, conquering the world and smiling. <laughs> and, you know, it wears white people out. Furthermore, black people are always, in the presence of white people, you're, you watch, you're, you're watching an imitation. And you realize this if you try to imitate it, because you cannot imitate an imitation. Therefore, the role of the black man in today's America, in today's America, has got to be what it always really was, or what the Republic always feared it was. He's, he is a man. And he, a man cannot be told what to do. A man cannot be defined by others. And there's nothing new about that. What the question really means is how should we alter the American model so that both the black man and the white man can be free? That's what the question means. I apologize to the person who wrote this because I'm having trouble reading it, so I'll get through it as well as I can. You talk about facing reality, at least by white America. Don't you think it's time for black America to uh, realize uh, that a great deal of its problems are, try are trying to blame them on the past in white America, isn't it time for blacks to face up to their own realities, to other realities? I think that's the general yeah. I drift of the question. Excuse me. Well, I've heard, th I've heard that before. Uh, I don't think that um, black people, in the generality certainly, can be accused of blaming their situation on the past or bl indeed blaming their situation on anybody. The situation is much too vivid, much too terrible for that kind of self-indulgence. But it isn't I, people I started out with. History is not the past. The situation in the black community in this country is abominable because this is a racist country. And every institution in this country is a racist institution. And the very last thing the Republic really wants is an autonomous black community. Anywhere. Everybody knows, for example, that if you build a school in a ghetto, you built a disaster factory. And the answer to that is not to bust a child to another neighborhood. The answer to that is to rebuild a city so that human beings can live in the city. Cities are not supposed to be built for money and to make a few people rich. Now, if we want to deal with that, we've got to go there. In the meantime, there's no point in blaming the black community for being upset about the community, because the community has always been at war with the republic. When we tried before, some time ago, there was a school strike in Harlem in which blacks and Puerto Ricans came into the schools declaring themselves responsible for the education of their children and it was a very successful strike. I was there, because I got nieces and nephews in school. It was broken by the United Federation of Teachers and by the city, <coughs> because they did not want, first of all, that those billions of dollars, which is, the, which is the education system, it is a billion dollar business, they did not want that money controlled by blacks and Puerto Ricans. And that is what we were up against, and it's not the past, and there's no point in blaming black people for it. few questions here that are related on a somewhat different topic. Why did you choose France as your residence or one of your residences? Do you consider yourself an exile or an expatriate? How would you compare the French attitude toward blacks with that of America? Or is there as much racism in France as here in the States? <laughs> I went to France in 1948 when I was quite young. I went there with $40, no French, no one-way ticket. Or in other words, I was getting out of here. I, would got, I didn't so much go to Paris as leave New York. And the reason I left New York was because I knew that one, one fine Tuesday, somebody was going to call me nigger just once too often, just once too often, and somebody was going to die 
and I didn't care which one of us it was. So I split. I didn't know what was going to happen to me in Paris, but I knew what was going to happen to me here. I grew up in Paris in a way, and then I came back. In a sense, one can say that my life in Paris prepared me to go south. Because I would never have gone south if I'd stayed here. I wouldn't have been, I'd, if I stayed alive, I'd have been a junkie or a prisoner. I'd have been in no state to go to Montgomery, Alabama. As, as for, I don't consider myself an expatriate. I don't consider myself an exile. I stayed away long enough to grow up, as I put it. And now I'm a commuter, I suppose. And um, the, do the doctrine of white supremacy, which is what, which is what I mean by, ra by racism, comes out of the so-called old world. It wasn't born in America, it was brought here. And when I first went to Paris, or to Europe, the French above all could always say, um, French first of all could say, you must be very happy to be here, but we don't treat Negroes the way you're treated in the States. And um, we're not racist like the Americans are. Well, I looked around me, and I could see that the reason that they could be so tolerant, as they thought, was because they didn't have any niggas in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> they were working for them far away, you know, Senegal, Algeria, and so forth. And so it was not a part of the social fabric. And of course, it was very good for me in a way, except my mama didn't raise no fools, you know. I realized that almost at once that the Algerian was a nigger in Paris. Because I was, I was poor, I was, so I, was, I was with them, in the same jails with them, the same hotels, sleeping in shifts. I know the way, I know the way they were treated. And in a way, that's what drove me home. Because I could see that what was happening, what didn't happen in my country, was the same thing that was happening in France. And since I was not French, couldn't do anything there, I, I came home because I didn't want to duck it. Now the doctrine of white supremacy, which seemed to uh, have, have affected Europe less, the cities of Europe, London, Paris, Belgium, Berlin, it's come back to Europe. And the same thing is going on in the European cities as is going on in the American cities. And for the same reason. <coughs> How would you compare the artistic and creative climate in France to that in the United States? Well, I guess the, the fairest thing to say is that the European experience, let's put it that way, is old enough for them to do... They're not afraid of artists. Now, this, is, this doesn't mean they love them, or that they respect them. They just know that every once in a while somebody like that is bound to come along, so they tolerate it. <laughs> and, if, you know, and if you live long enough, or if you are safely dead, you are, they build a statue to you. In the meantime, you're on your own. Thanks. <laughs> The questioner asks, as a white person reading some of your stories and books, I felt a great deal of prejudice and hatred against a white race. Did I misinterpret? A great deal of ha hatred? Uh, prejudice and hatred against whites. Uh, I don't think that I have the, my life's too short for one thing. No, 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 I don't think, I don't think it's either prejudice or hatred against whites. After all, if I may say so, I wrote another country. And I wrote Giovanni's Room, which can hardly be called anti-white diatribes. But I think that, I think that whenever, whenever a black person tries to tell the truth about his situation to white people, or to people who think they're white, because white is, white is a state of mind, it's even a moral choice. Every time, if, if my testimony is true, my testimony is a black citizen of this country, or a black would-be citizen of this country, and my testimony is true, that the American myth is a lie. And when this collision happens, I am accused of being prejudiced against white people. 
I have better sense and don't have that much time. I don't have some white person locked up in my skull, walking around with me every day and every hour. White people have a black person they're locked up in their skulls, their skulls. And that is how they, that's why they treat black people the way they do. If you see what I mean. There's uh, several questions here. You can choose which one you want to answer. Uh, they generally deal on the same broad topic. How would you assess the state of race relations in America today? How much change do you see since the fire next time? What are the true issues, issues before American civil rights leaders today? Are any false? So on. You, you'll see them all here. <laughs> Well, it's a very difficult question to answer, you know, seriously, because it's um, the question is the question is sincere, but it's po but it's posed in such. Let me, why don't, you know, what I would like to do, what I would really like to do, is an idea which may, maybe could, we can take hold of in this room. I want to establish modest proposal, White History Week. <laughs> Because the answer to these questions is not to be found in me, but in that history which produces these questions. It's late in the day to be talking about race relations. What are you talking about? And if as long as we have race relations, how can they deteriorate or improve? I am not a race and neither are you. No, we're talking about the life and death of this country. And one of the things, I'm not joking when I talk about White History Week, one of the things that most afflicts this country is that white people don't know who they are or where they come from. And that's why you think I'm a problem. But I am not the problem. Your history is. And as long as you pretend you don't know your history, you're going to be the prisoner of it. And there's no question of you're liberating me, because you can't liberate yourselves. We're in this together. And finally, when white people, quote unquote white people, talk about progress in relationship with black people, all they are saying and all they can possibly mean by the word progress is how quickly and how thoroughly I become white. I don't want to become white. I want to grow up, and so should you. Thank you. With the deaths of Malcolm X and Reverend King in the 1960s, black America lost its most activist and disobedient leaders. With the shift of black emphasis to politics in corporate America, is this a positive change in the right direction? I don't know how to answer that question because I don't quite know what the, what the question means about corporate America. And I don't quite know what connection that has with human freedom or what we call democracy and a change in the right direction. I think that the uh, future is not nearly as simple as Americans like to think. I'm not convinced that the machine is going to resolve so many problems. I know that we have we've got uh, to, to confront, I think, the fact that if we don't share the earth, we may, we blow it, we're going to blow it up. I think we have to rethink everything we think is true now because it's not going to be true tomorrow. The, the, the question supposes a future which is more or less coherent and which is safe. But in fact, the moral choice we have yet to make does not guarantee that anyone in this room has a future. And the only way we can accommodate ourselves to that is to rethink and recreate our vocabulary, which includes the human race. We are all in this, in this room, at the mercy of, whether or not we know it, the European vision of the world. And that vision is obsolete. What is the proper role of the black 
politician today in American society? I would think that the, black, the, the proper role of the black politician in American society is to do what some people, in fact, are doing, which is to, to resist the definitions, to instruct, and to attempt to liberate the children who are the most crucial issue, and to have the courage to contest the American reality. It may sound outrageous, for example, but consider this. When I was born, when I was growing up, various people blew themselves up in homemade stills and died drinking bathtub gin because alcohol was illegal and dope was illegal. It did not mean that anybody stopped drinking, not at all. It just meant that various people made tremendous fortunes out of illegal liquor, and various people died out of illegal liquor. A new form of crime was created, and that's all that happened. Now, we want to get to the, to the heart of the dope problem, legalize it. That destroys the profit motive and may save our children. Nobody who has a habit who can afford it is going to go to jail. So it's a law which in operation can be used only against the poor. And a, and a law like that is a bad law. And it does not stop anybody from his fix. It just puts some people in jail and some people under the ground because a whole lot of money is being made on the anti-dope law, which does not work. That is one of the things I think a black politician might suggest to white politicians, if you see what I mean. What, contem <coughs> excuse me, what contemporary topic or topics interest you the most these days? <laughs> um. I think I'm really going to be obsessed with the future of the young because um, we, the elders, are responsible for that. And um, I myself, I think, you know, I learn a lot from young people because young people are unlike, are unlike um, people my age. In the generality, I was on the road really, you know, to find out if it was true what people were telling me that. The youth of America have become hopelessly apathetic and middle-aged and dead. There are a great many things in the people I met, and I've been on the road for a year, but none of those things. The truth, I think, is that their elders have betrayed them by throwing jaguars at them in TV sets and other kind of paraphernalia instead of trying to teach them, instead of trying to raise them, instead of loving them and that they've been abandoned to the dream of safety. And children, unlike their elders, are not very easily fooled. That's what fascinates me today. Would you please comment on Wol Solyinka and the Nobel Prize awarded to him in 1986? Was that a political act? Well. On one level, certainly, it's a political act, you know, um, a concession, perhaps, even. On the other hand, um, Soyenka deserves it. it uh, it's a political gesture. It will not have the effect whoever the Academy might have hoped. But it is a symptom of what has to, be, what has to become. You see, the question is impossible to answer because the suggestion is that the politics of tomorrow is um, like the politics of, politics of today, and it, it ain't gonna, just, it's not going to be that way. No one, no one in this room now really knows what a political gesture really means, because no one is able to envision the future it's meant to bring about, if that makes sense to you. Why do you believe that simplicity is an, is an American virtue? Isn't the simple man the virtuous model in most societies, certainly in communist states, 
where dissent is unpatriotic. Would you read that again? Certainly. Why do you believe that simplicity is an American virtue? I don't know if you said no, quite like that. Uh, but isn't the simple man a virtuous model in most societies, certainly in communist states, where dissent is unpatriotic? Dissent is unpatriotic everywhere. The purpose of the state is to remain the state. Let's not be romantic about that. And I didn't say that simplicity is an American virtue. I said Americans think that it's an American virtue. And isn't the simple man the virtuous model in most societies, certainly in communist states, where his dissent is unpatriotic? The simple man depends, well, it depends on what you mean by simplicity. Simple is not necessarily simple-minded. Or one goes this far and say that no man is simple. It is not possible. It's a contradiction in terms. Every society has a model of itself. And every society's model of itself is false. Let us face that too. I don't, I had read where I started. No state is anxious to have dissenters in it, including this one. And there's more than one way to skin a cat and more than one way to silence a dissenter. Mr. Baldwin, there's a, another one of these threesomes here that we're going to try to make into one question. Are, aren't you perpetuating the white-black problem by criticizing whites and glorifying blacks? If blacks and whites are supposed to be one and the same, don't you think Black History Week and similar days, weeks, keep us separate? And of all this, do you feel that racism has accurately been cited as a reason for so many of today's problems? <coughs> Well, I'll take the middle question first. Um, I was not joking about White History Week. After all, I was told quite some time ago when I was growing up that George Washington couldn't tell a lie. And um, did or did not chop down the cherry tree, I forget. Uh, I'm serious about that. White, white Americans really do not know their history. And that's one of the reasons they're in trouble. And I, when, I, when I suggest White History Week, I'm not really just par you know, par or making a parody of Black History Week. But I'm suggesting that the truth about this country is buried in the myths that white people have about themselves. And, they have, and these myths have to be excavated. They can only be excavated by white people. Or, in other words, I may know this history, the history of this country, better than whatever teacher is trying to teach my child. Because I, it's in my interest to understand it in order to be liberated from it. Most white Americans cling to the idea of, the, of being white and, you know, because they don't want to find out what else, what else they might be. But if I know that I have black and white ancestors, so do you. And no one in this country can prove they're white. No one would dare to try to prove that. And I'm not trying to glorify black people or denigrate white people. I'm trying to point out that we are, whether we like it or not, connected, and that a connection should be our triumph and our glory instead of our shame. <laughs> uh, before asking our guests the last question, I would like to present Mr. Baldwin with a certificate of appreciation for appearing at the National Press Club, as well as the National Press Club paperweight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, I know we've asked our guests many hard questions today, but some people may think this is the hardest one of them all. Uh, Mr. Baldwin, which of your books do you consider the best and why? I think every writer, well, I'll be honest, as honest as I can be, I think every writer has two answers to that question. And the first answer is the next one. It's true. And if I have a favorite, if any author has a favorite among the books he's published, um, he's always a little bit afraid to say so, but I'm going to take a chance. And the reason that one, that the author, has a favorite book 
very often is because the book was so badly treated. It's like having a, having a bad, you know, a child of yours badly treated. It's unjustly, you know. You, didn't have, you shouldn't have treated him that way. And the novel I'm thinking about, which is so badly treated, is uh, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Once again, I'd like to thank our guest, Mr. James Baldwin, for appearing at this National Press Club luncheon. This concludes today's luncheon. Thank you. Thank you.